program. It would make it easier for me tailoring the, the last half of this session. If uh, you could tell me um, if you're an experienced birder, if you're brand new to birding, which some people are, and that's okay. We only deal with a few species and we have very experienced mentors on hand. And also if you have been with the program, if you could let us know how long you've been with the program and why you do it, you know, where you monitor and, and why you enjoy doing it. I'm, I'm taking it for granted that you enjoy doing it, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Anna, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to start first? <laughs> yes, sure. Um, I'm new to birding. I started um, last fall. And since then, I've traveled to Chile with the uh, Golden Gate Audubon Society and got uh, hundreds of live birds, of course. And I, I have a science background um, in biology. My senior thesis was in coyote communication. Um, I've been a molecular biologist for a long time. And after that, um, I practice law. I, I'm now retired and just enthralled by the wondrous life of birds. So I, I'm dedicated to that in my retirement. So that's why I'm here. Wonderful. Diane Hicks. Uh, uh, Diane Halsey. Uh, hi, I'm in Bodega Bay and I'm um, new to, um, to the birds that you watch. I Last fall, I um, went out with the hawk watchers and watched the raptors and they put on quite a show and I enjoyed that so much and I thought that uh, it'd be great to see the seabirds and also um, I feel like um, Hollis is such a Pied Piper and I followed her to the tide pools <laughs> and now I'm following her to the, um, to the seabirds. Nice to see you here, Diane. Bill. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, Bill Perry, I live in Bodega Bay also, and uh, this is my third season with the seabird monitoring. And um, I'm retired. My background is in wildlife biology and GIS. And um, I've been an avid birder for most of my life. And uh, I enjoy the outdoors and meeting uh, kindred spirits and uh, doing volunteering for uh, this organization. And I also was up on Hawk Watch um, the last several years, counting the raptors at Jenner Headlands. And um, I do volunteer for the Sonoma Land Trust doing GIS work and also did some uh, shorebird counts down at Sonoma Bay Lands. And uh, so it's, it's a great way to meet people and be outdoors in such a beautiful, uh, setting. And we ask for, for the benefit of those that are new, we ask that if you commit to one shift a month, mm -hmm. that a lot of people get really involved in what's going on. Uh oh, you're frozen. Am I, am I okay now? You're back. Yes. Okay. And um, some people like Bill, you can't keep them away. <laughs> <laughs> He's out there almost every week. <laughs> but it's fun to track the progress like that. Mm -hmm. So Mary, out there with Bill this year. Yeah, um, this is my very beginning. I guess I've been out there maybe maybe four times with Bill and Ellie. Um, my birding, I took ornithology um, 50 years ago, but I've been just a casual birder. And now that I'm retired, I'm um, just, is, I just, have, just love it. And it's uh, really nourishing to be back in the flow of, of um, watching nature, having sidelined over to psychology for a long time. So, um, so casual birder, casual knowledge, uh, lots, lots to learn. And um, I think that's, I think that's it. Really happy to be out there with Bill and Ellie and Chris. And um, it's just fantastic. Okay, now for the benefit of those that are new, so haven't been on the email list, uh, you and Bill should share, um, you were treated to a great site last Friday beyond your count. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that we wanna stress when you're um, filling out your data forms is that the numbers are great. You know, we need the numbers, but the notes are really, really colorful because they paint a picture of what else is going on out there. And you guys were treated to, um, a site with the peregrine last week. Do you want to talk about that? Bill, I think you caught that 
magical moment uh, more clearly than I did. I think you should tell the story. <clears throat> well, yes, we were treated to a pretty special occurrence. So there's been a pair of peregrine falcons that have nested out there on the cliff by Gull Rock. And um, I think last year they fledged three young. So they've been sort of spotty on and off since we started monitoring the season. But this week, this last week, we were treated to the the adults flying around, and then I noticed, happened just to catch it, um, the passing of a prey item between, I believe, would be the male to the female. And the female come, turns upside down, the male drops the bird, and then they flew off and actually landed at one of the close rocks right offshore. And and uh, I think the male just watched the female as she was just devouring this bird. I, it was a light gray bird. I'm not sure what species it was, despite our being able to glass right on it, but uh, pretty spectacular. I think that's the second time we've actually seen this kind of behavior from this pair of peregrines there. So that <clears throat> just goes to show you never know what you might see when you're out looking at seabirds. There's all kinds of neat stuff out there. Yeah, when you're treated to one of those courtship displays, it's really, really special. Yeah. I really envy you. Mm -hmm. Kate. Um, well, I'm kind of bird ignorant. I mean, I don't know. I don't know a heck of a lot, but I, I, I'm interested because I'm interested in coastal life. So it seems to me that birds are good indicators of what else is going on. I mean, I don't always, I don't have the equipment here to monitor, you know, the really little inverts or things like that, like my daughter used to do, but I can see, I can see if I can't monitor all the predators, I can cert or the prey, I can certainly monitor some of the, the predators out there. Um, so I just, you know, I'm interested to see what's going on. I'm just curious. Well, one of the reasons that biologists are really interested in seabirds is because they consider them to be good indicators of the health of the sea. Right. You know, the food chain. And they refer to them as canaries in the coal mine. But as you well know, Kate, if you study nudibranchs, those guys call the nudibranchs the canaries in the coal mine. You know, it all depends on what you're looking at. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Juliana. Hi, I had three years at Bodega Bay and um, I started the naturalist program through stewards. And uh, for my capstone project, I chose the birding program. So I've since moved inland but I love the birding program so much and fell in love with my special place <laughs> and my birds that I'm gonna come down at least once a month. I'm making that commitment. Good. <clears throat> Sarah. On mute, sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, my background is post-colonial eco-criticism. So that's nation building with a special emphasis on looking at animals and ethics and how nations are built. Uh, despite that academic jargon, I'm also hands-on very much with uh, animal rescue. And I followed the Pied Piper Hollis as well to get involved with these programs. And I'm really excited to see uh, second year how it will be. So glad to be here. Nice to see you, Sarah. <laughs> Um, Sylvia. Well, I don't consider myself a birder. I, I like all wildlife and anything that I can watch. And I, I really am fascinated by behavior of the things that I see. And I like to photograph it. And I followed the Pied Piper too, because um, I was asking questions about oyster catchers and Hollis had some good answers. So, um, I got recruited. Sarah was out, um, Sylvia was out at Bodega Head on the west side last year, as um, Sarah and I know. And she was taking fabulous photographs. And um, what was really nice was that uh, she wound up taking an ornithology class at College of Marin and then a CalNAT class. And one of the things that I really enjoy about this program is seeing people who really don't have any background or experience with birds and um, they see them raising their families and it's really wonderful to see them get involved with them because this is something that's given me great pleasure you know for many many years so and she has a really really nice lens 
It's, mm -hmm. it's got this big, it hauls it around. So she's been able to get some wonderful shots and video. Bonnie. Okay, I'm just unmuting. Um, <laughs> I've been a beginning birder now for probably 60 years. And I'm happy beginning. It's just great. You just, it's always new. Um, my background is psychology, so I'm especially interested in bird behavior. But I just love being out there and seeing the, not only the birds, but just everything out at the coast. Mm -hmm. I think I've been doing this for five or six years, but I'm not sure. I've done all the sites, but right now I'm mainly doing Bodega Head West. And we may, if we have enough people this year, we may be um, starting up Gleason again, Bonnie. Okay, that, I might do that. Yeah, yeah. Juliana did it last year on her own because um, she could not get vaccinated. And so, right. you know, for her own protection, she was out there at Gleason all by herself, um, yeah. enjoying those peregrines. <laughs> yes. So actually, I am vaccinated. I just have an autoimmune disorder, so oh, that's right. Really, that's right. I'm really high risk. In fact, yeah. I'm four vaccines in, uh, so I'm super careful. But you know, I love Gleason. It's not not a lot of people can hang out there, and so it was when there was one on one time. It felt really special, and I even bought a stool now for my scope. So when I'm out there, the kids can hop up. Uh, oh. Yeah, so that's part of that's always in my car now is a, a little stool, step stool. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's the story of me, and I'm really hoping we can do Gleason. <laughs> and uh, there's Girl. been a lot of photographers out <clears throat> at Gleason lately because of the peregrines. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah they were they were there, and it was interesting to watch, uh, for sure. When is, what are the hours of Gleason? When, when do you monitor at Gleason and what day? So I'm flexible. I have, I'm continuing my um, CalNet studies here and it's one weekend out of the month. So I can come down, I'm luckily not working right now. So any time that people are interested in going, I'll be there at least one day out of the month and um, you know, if people want to do Gleason, I would love to share what I know. And any day, actually, I think we have to work with when the equipment is available. So that's up to our Pied Piper. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that's where to go. Uh, <laughs> so, Bonnie, does that answer your question? That it's, you know. Yeah, that, that, there are certain times that work for me and times that don't. Like Gull Rock turned out to be too early, and for the most part, Bodega, Bodega Rock is at my nap time. So if <laughs> okay, well, you know, I found that the light was good. Uh, really, any time of the day in the late afternoon, you get the backlight from the sun. But you know, usually I was about there 10, 30, 11, and uh, really good visibility, and the wind's not picked up then. So um, yeah, I if think. You want yeah, I think we can work something out. Love it. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> Tall is back yet? No. <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> Carol, do you want to say hi? Or Mary Jo? Yes, hi, I'm Mary Jo. I'm, I just arrived. I apologize uh, for being late. Um, oh, we were just doing introductions. Um, okay. Whether or not you have a uh, birding experience, experience with the Seabird program and just what brings you here today. Oh, great. I can speak to that. Um, I have been a member of Audubon for four years. And um, before COVID went on bird walks two or three times a month and really enjoyed it. During COVID, of course, it's only just beginning to pick back up. So I'm still a new birder, but I, I do love it. And um, this just seemed like, and I just retired uh, 12 months ago and I started doing whale watch dove sitting. 
and um, was encouraged um, when people learned I enjoyed birding to um, try this out. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Great. Sorry that I dropped out there. Um, Carol. Carol, are you there? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's Oliver. Hi. Well, she may, Carol may have dropped out. So, um, oh, there she is. Oh, she doesn't have sound or picture. Okay, well, we're all doing well, our internet gremlins today. So um, I'd like to start with a slideshow that um, gives you an idea of what's going on out at the rocks. Now, in most of the sites, those offshore rocks are about a third of a mile away. So you can count the birds with the scope, but you really um, can't see the dynamics between individuals and between um, different species because you're just too far away. But there's one site, and that's on the west side of a head where you can. So most of these photographs were taken there over the years, and um, it gives you an idea of the family life of these guys. So can I share my screen? Yeah, you, you should be co-host, Hollis. Okay. Um, you got it. Are we good? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a citizen science program. And Mary Ellen Hannibal um, says that if you want to deepen your experience of life, the first thing to do is start observing. And it seems that most of us on this call are observers. But the difference with doing it for community science or citizen science is that it's a way to observe with consequences and that you're documenting what you're seeing and that documentation is used for other purposes that, that can be consequential. We're a member of the Seabird Protection Network, which is under the auspices of the, Gulf of the, uh, the Greater Fairlands Marine Sanctuary. And what they do is they do a lot of public outreach with boaters and pilots in order to reduce the number of disturbances of seabird colonies. And we do three, perhaps four rocks. And uh, Bill and Mary were talking about Gull Rock, which is just south of Jenner. And um, there are common MERS there. Uh, initially, this was a Brant's Cormorant colony until 2012 when common MERS showed up. And because they arrive earlier than, than the cormorants, they eventually pushed them out completely. And there was one year where the, um, the uh, MERS were rafting in the water and weren't climbing the rock because the peregrines were sitting on top. And this allowed the cormorants to get a foothold. So it was interesting to see how one species was influencing the use of real estate by the other two. And um, this fellow up here is one of the peregrines. And Bill and Mary were talking about being treated to a food exchange last Friday, which is a, a courtship ritual. In Gleason Rock, where Juliana was last year, um, we have a number of species that are nesting there besides the peregrines. Um, over here, we have pelagic cormorants. Uh, they like to nest on these tall, sheer cliffs because um, they feel safe from predators. There are double crested cormorants on the side of um, the rock here. On top of Gleason Rock, there are Western gulls, and here's some spotted chicks. And then um, on the crevices, of uh, the face of the rock are the pigeon guillemots, and they're just wonderful. They have these bright red feet, bright red throats during breeding season, and you, you can distinguish them by their little white patches here. They're very playful. Bodega Rock is in the middle of Bodega Bay. It has been a branch rock colony, and they have shared this rock with um, California sea lions and also stellar sea lions, which are 
uh, the males, the bulls are absolutely enormous. A couple of years ago, about two years ago, um, some common murs appeared on Bodega Rock and we learned that it's not uncommon for them to be prospecting. And so last year we had our first documented evidence of they're actually starting to breed. And not this last Monday, but the Monday before, I think Carol and Rich counted 400 of them. And so the literature says that it's a rare opportunity to be able to observe the formation of the common mer colony. And this is what we're being treated to right now. And then there's the west side of Bodega Head. And we do this a little bit differently because it's part of the marine protected area. And there were um, baseline uh, surveys that were done 10 years ago when the MPAs are being um, implemented. And they were counting birds on the water, just not on the rock. And so we're doing that as well so that we're keeping in sync with what they did. And this traditionally has been, the main rock out there traditionally has been inhabited by um, Western gulls. But what's happened is that the Brant's cormorant have, uh, they kind of dominated last year, probably because they were being pushed off of gull rock. So we've been, last year was really a case of musical rock. So these are, these. if you're new to birding, um, we deal with very few species. The only problem is distinguishing the three species of cormorants. But you will be shadowing um, experienced mentors. Um, there are, you know, there are certain species that cling to certain rocks. And so um, you're not going to get confused by them. But the Brant's cormorants, um, they have these large feet. They're heavy bodied. When you see them in the air, their necks are straight. They're often flying in groups. The pelagic cormorants are smaller. They have um, red faces. They have these white flank patches during breeding season. They like to breed on the, the sheer rock faces, these little tiny shelves, as I'm going to show you, because they feel um, more protected from predators. The double crested, which we have at Gleason, have this is a young one. You can tell by the light throat. And their gulars are bright orange. And when they fly, they can be distinguished by the crooked neck. Mm. And they're not flying in groups. Normally, they're just in ones or twos. Um, everybody loves the black oyster catchers. Uh, you usually hear them before you see them. Mm -hmm. And these are the little pigeon guillemots I was talking about before. They're very, very playful. and They're fun to watch. And this gives you an idea of the size of a common myrrh compared to the Brant's cormorant. And they're tiny, you know, they're less than half the size, but they tend to arrive earlier than the cormorants. And so they claim their territory and that's how they've succeeded in pushing them out. So with courtship, the gulars of the cormorants become very, very colorful. This is a branch with a bright blue. This is what happens with the double crested. They get these wonderful crests. Their eyes are like turquoise. And their throats are these deep azure blue colors, rounded by this orange. And when they're on Gleason, even though Gleason is a ways out with the scope, you're able to pick up that deep azure blue, and it's absolutely stunning. Uh, Hollis? Yes. Can I, can I ask a, a question and also um, ask if you'd like to invite folks to chime in during or wait till the end? But I was curious what a gular is. OK, a gular is this pouch right here. You know, a pelican has an enormous pouch. These guys have these small pouches, and that's what a gular is. And it becomes very, very colorful when they're breeding. Thank you. And please, jump in jump in any time with questions or comments for the veterans. Um, there are several gulls, species of gulls that you're seeing along the coast right now. But the only one, the only resident that stays here throughout the breeding season is the western gull. And here are the little guillemots again. So this photograph was taken right off of Bodega Head. And you can see how bright their feet are and how bright their throats are. And they spin like little tops showing, showing off the bright red. Now their nests are, are very, very different. Um, this is the pelagic cormorant. And you can tell by the white flanks here. Uh, she's sitting on three eggs, and um, it's this looks like straw material. It's vegetation. It's always vegetation. Sometimes it's algae. Um, 
you know, it looks like wet seaweed, but this down here is a um, double crested cormorant. Uh, they're the only ones that will also nest near freshwater as well as salt water. They will nest in trees. Here they don't, but that's why their nest is made of sticks. They're the only, they're the only species of cormorant that will ever use sticks because they're the only ones in trees. But our marine versions here that nest on Gleason, for example, um, they use vegetation, they use seaweed. These are the brants over here. They're, they're sharing space. Uh, they use vegetation. The oyster catchers are really interesting. Um, this one here has a nest of pebbles and they don't look like they're arranged in any kind of order, but they actually build practice nests before deciding on one. And when they're courting, uh, one will walk around and pick up pebbles with those long mandibles, the long bills, and toss them over his back. And um, this is a track to his mate for some reason, but this looks like a haphazard arrangement here, but it really isn't, not to them. And can we go back for a second? When, when you talked about the cormorants, you said it's the double crested that use these sticks. Is that correct? Not, not always, but if there is a stick nest, it's a double crested. If you see a, if you see a cormorant in fresh water, is it likely that it's going to be this? It's a double crested. Okay, I've never, I, I saw my first cormorant in, in fresh water last week and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I had no clue. Okay, yeah, thank no, you. No, no. Um, you'll see them at Spring Lake. I was over in Foothills. Okay, yeah, they, yeah, if, if, when they're inland, um, and they nest around Spring Lake. They nest in trees. Oh wow! In fact, if you're if you're driving 116 uh, from Duncan's Mill out to the coast, uh, there's one area about two miles west of Duncan's Mills where it, it, all of a sudden it's clear and you can see across the river. And um, on the east side, if you look up the river, you'll find um, that there's a group of them nesting there in trees. I don't I don't know where Duncan's Mills is yet. Oh, look it up. oh okay. Oh, I that's am right. going You're to Spring Lake. Lake. I am going to Spring Lake uh, either this week or next week, and I'll keep an eye open, though. Yeah, no, that's, you know, it's a double crested. The other okay, two are you. strictly marine animals. And in fact, one of the other two is called a pelagic cormorant. Right. So that's a hit right, right there. Yeah. And I knew, I knew that, but I just couldn't, I mean, that's why I was surprised. I thought, I thought they were all saltwater coastal birds. I, I didn't expect to see them in, uh, in um, fresh water. Yeah. And, and you can see now, this is, this is taken on Bodega Head, which is granite. And you can see how closely the eggs uh, just blend right in to the background there. Okay, and this pair of um, oyster catchers has, has decided not to use pebbles, but shells. And again, this looks like a haphazard arrangement, but it isn't to them. Um, you'll often see one of them sitting on eggs and you have to wait for the shift change, you know, for the mate to return in order to um, actually glimpse the eggs and, and be able to take account. Okay, so this is the Western gull. They have a darker mantle than the others. And as I said, they're the only ones that are resident here year round. They're the only ones who breed here. And then this is a little cup and it's the main rock off of the west side of the Dega Head. If you're looking from the parking lot or from where you're, the, the whale watch people are. And uh, we were there one day and you know, you can tell he's got vegetation here for the nest and it's perfectly respectable. You know, this is enough of a nest. But we came back two days later and they had become a little ambitious and this nest had grown. <laughs> and it was getting a little unwieldy because this is just a little pocket on the rock and it keeps growing. And this guy here is hauling up the hill with even more in his mouth to pile on top. And she's trying to secure the egg. There's one egg in this nest. For some reason, this pair year after year only had only laid one egg. It was only an only child every year. And now it's getting really ridiculous and they're both at work trying to hold this thing up. And you can see a single egg that's just perched on top here precariously. He's still dumping more, thinking that that's going to help. 
Now they've attracted the attention of the other gulls, wondering what the hell they're doing. Do they use mud or anything to secure it to the rock or? No, the pelagic cormorants use guano. So this is just, you know, it's not even woven in there. It's just dumped, which is why they're having problems with this one. This guy's, I don't know if he's trying to help out or if he's just curious about what's going on. He finally spills in. So besides nesting, they have other problems. Um, there's a pair of ravens that nest out at Bodega Head. And you can see by the three with their bright pink mouths, that they're hungry all the time. This is an oyster catcher chasing off a raven. And for those of you that are familiar with the oyster catchers, you know, you know what a rare sight this is because they have no weapons. Um, they're just kind of geeky, gawky animals with these bright pink feet and toenails that, that really, they have no means of defending themselves, but um, they do have a very high pitched voice. And this is a pair of baby ravens. And this was, they had just fled. They flew out onto this, this rock that was not too far from their nest. You can tell they're babies. They're, they still have some coloration around their mouths and um, they're not very shiny. And when they landed on this rock, they landed five or six feet apart. An oyster catcher flew by and squawked at them and then they just huddled very close together. So the other thing that tells you that these are juvenile ravens is their attitude. They just don't have the raven confidence yet. And this is a young peregrine. This was taken out by gull rock. And you can tell it's a youngster because of the vertical barring on the breast. It's not horizontal. But take a look at those talons. This is an animal to be reckoned, reckoned with. And I think, Bonnie, wasn't it you that noticed that um, at Gleason one year that you didn't see any chicks, any Western gull chicks or cormorant chicks until, was it August? It wasn't me. It must okay. have been somebody else. Yeah. And the reason why was because of the peregrines um, out at Gleason that were flying overhead all the time. Here's a peregrine that's making off with a grebe out of Bodega Harbor. And so now we get to raising a family. And the gulls have these really, really cute spotted fuzzy chicks. And um, as they grow older, they start getting real feathers on their whole body, except for their heads. And so like other cocky teenagers, they look really ridiculous instead of cute after a while because they still have these little, these little pin heads with these gawky bodies. But some people don't like gulls, but if you observe them with their families, they're very patient and they're very loving. And here are two of them looking out to see. You can see there's still an egg in this one nest here. The oyster catchers, um, when they're hatch, they're able to run around on the rock. I mean, they, you know, they've got, they have um, feathers. Um, they can see what they're doing. They're curious. And uh, like all youngsters, if you have a three-year-old kid, you know that they climb everything that they see. And this guy did as well, except that he doesn't quite know how to get down. And he's figured out that he knows and his stubby little wings here. And he finally gets him on. This is the pair that likes to use the shells for a nest. And he hit safety and he ran right back up and started over again. But now he's figured out that he can slide down sideways. Mary, I see you smiling. So um, they eat oysters, I mean, I'm sorry, mussels. They eat worms that live in the mussel beds. And here, when, they, when they're this little, um, the parents go out and they forage and they get the meat out of the mussel and they bring it back to the babies. They don't bring the shell back, but they just bring the meat back. And this looked like an enormous hunk of meat for this little guy to handle, but he just scarfed it right down, no problem at all. You can see they look like little wind-up toys. They're just really, really darling with their funny little feet. And as they get older, the parents decide that they're going to teach them how to manipulate those mandibles 
in order to extract meat out of a muscle. And you can see there's been a lot of lessons, a lot of feeding here by the pile of muscle shells here. And he's still observing. Hollis, when was the last time you saw oyster catchers successfully raise kids at Bodega Head? Three years ago. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Sylvia, there are three there are three areas where they nest off of Bodega Head. Um, this one actually, um, this youngster here is the rock that's to your right. You know, as you and you're looking down, it's the, it was the pair that we were watching last year. And um, you saw you saw the chicks when they were one day old before they were yeah. lost because of the drown. That was this rock. Oh. Um, there's there's also a pair that nests on the large main rock, you know, with the gulls and the cormorants, and it's on the back side of the rock where you'll see little pools of seawater. And oddly enough, that pair has been successful more years than not. And um, some of us feel that it might be that the gulls offer some kind of protection to them. But no, it, but no, they fail more than they succeed. And, um, you know, you watch them on eggs for 30 days and they hatch and they're just these cute little wind up toys. And every year that I watch this, I go, okay, do not get emotionally invested in this. And, you know, you know, you can't help it. You just fall in love with them. Um, I used to think that cormorants are just kind of these amorphous bladders out there until I started to get to know them. And these are the pelagic cormorants. And this is what I mean by nesting on these little tiny ledges on these sheer rock faces. And like this nest, you can see there are three or four chicks, three chicks here and parents. And look at the size of this little, this little shelf that they use. And they're very, very loving. They're very, very affectionate. These shiny ones are adults. These dull looking ones are chicks and you can see them growing. Uh, Justin, this is a little pink gular here from the youngster. And there's no sibling rivalry with these guys. You know, that, that, that it, just won't, it just won't work on these little tiny shelves. They're very, very cooperative. Which kind of so cormorant so, is this? Uh, which, which cormorant is this? This is the pelagic. I don't is, see the white that I thought would help identify them. Oh, well, they, well, these are chicks. Uh huh. Okay. The, okay. Uh, it starts to fade pretty quickly once they, once they have their eggs and their chicks. Oh. It's just, it's just during the, um, well, there's a little bit of white left on this one. Okay. Thanks. Again, if you see them on a site like this, you know, it's a pelagic cormorant. They're the only ones that breed on these little, little shelves. Um, it's interesting, if you look at a, um, if, if you look at a rock and if the top is kind of level, um, that is Brant's cormorant territory. Where it slopes on the sides, uh, the double crested that breed out in the marine environment, they prefer the sides to the top. And the pelagic, like the sheer rock, Faces here, these rock walls. Um, so, you know, they're in this confined space and like how they exercise and their pectoral muscles. And what they do is they take turns. This little tiny nest here has three of them. And number one gets his shot at it. Now he's moved aside. Now it's number two that gets his turn. Still working at it. And now number three gets his turn. Hmm. The gulls, on the other hand, they're out in the open and they're jumping up and down, exercising their wings. And it's really a trip when a gust of wind comes along and picks them up and it really surprises them. Then it comes time to fledge. Do these wings really work? And this was a pelagic cormorant family. The parents were down below calling and two of the chicks were down with the parents. And this guy was just really, he was just reluctant. He just did not want to make the leap. It's a leap of faith for them. And he finally did, but didn't hit the water and he landed on this other little ledge here. 
They were still calling. And finally he took off and he hit the sea for the first time. And seeing a pelagic animal hit the water for the first time is really kind of a thrill. In August, um, you, you might be treated to flight school on Bodega Head. And the adults will be circling. It's usually a windy day and they're circling and they're calling to the chicks. And finally they take off. And the adults are such strong flyers that in the wind, if you watch them land, it's almost like they, they kite down perfectly. And they're very, very strong and they, they land just where they want to. These guys, the youngsters, that's a skill that they haven't learned yet. And so when they land on the rock, it's just, you know, they're rolling all over the place. It's not a secure situation for them at all. And you saw those little spotted guys when they're ready to fledge, they have these beautiful full feathers here. And they'll, they'll look the same size as the adults. In some cases, they look maybe a little bit larger and that's because their flight feathers are a little bit larger. Um, it's kind of like training wheels. So this is just the beginning. 10% of juveniles survive their first year once they fledge. The black oyster catching fledging success down in Monterey County in 2012 is only 15%. Black oyster catchers reach sexual maturity at about five years of age, but they have not yet developed the skills at foraging in order to successfully feed a family. Western gulls don't breed until they're four years of age, and all cormorant species reach sexual maturity at two years. So, um, this is why uh, black oyster catchers are uh, in trouble. There are only about 10,000 of them, and more than half of those are north of, um, north of British Columbia. Um, Sylvia, as you've noticed, um, you know, they're not often successful. And with climate change, uh, because of where they breed, um, that habitat is going to be lost with rising seawater. So there's a lot of concerns about them. Uh, down in Pacific Grove, uh, where they're exposed at low tide, you'll see these signs ringing the whole area around there, um, warning people to keep their distance. So that's it. That slideshow. Any questions? Yes, I had a question. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was just great. I really enjoyed all those photographs. It's amazing photographs that birders take. Um, should we be using the shape of the rocks? You went over the shape of the rocks relative to which kind of cormorants uh, perch on or 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 breed. Um, and if so, could you repeat those um, three types and of rock okay. formations? It's a general rule, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, generally, um, the brants prefer a flatter type of terrain, flatter type of surface, but not always. Okay, on gull rock, when they were being pushed out by the um, by the common mers. Like they were grabbing whatever territory they could get. Uh, Bodega rock doesn't have those nice flat surfaces, but that's where the, you know, but they're breeding there. Um, if given a choice, the double crested, if you if you look at it, Gleason rock, they're not on top, they tend to be on the slope on the side. And the pelagics like the steep, sheer rock faces, the rock walls. Now, um, I was doing an oyster catcher survey in 2011 or 2012, and um, my section was all up and down the coast, and we pulled and parked north of Jenner and had to climb over a guardrail uh, to get out to this area so that we could see the rocks. You know, I don't know if you're north of Jenner, there are all these little jagged rocks that stick out into the water. And um, I had never been out there, and I was just stunned to see um, one rock in the distance on the south side and the top was flat and there was a group of Grant's Pomerantz nesting there. And then where it sloped down at the side, there is a group of double crested. And then the front was almost a vertical rock face 
And there were the pelagics. I had never seen all three species on one rock in one place and where they belong. You know, it was, it was textbook. That just doesn't happen. So that's a general rule, but it's not hard and fast. You need to look at the color of the gulars. And the double crested will be orange. The, um, the brants, you saw that one photograph where they were in that, that, um, that breeding posture and um, his neck was up and it was an intense blue. That blue starts to fade pretty quickly. Tell us, I just, yeah, so at Gleason, there's all three species last season of the Comoroc and the Brants and the, uh, the double crested, they were up on top, double crested on the side, pelagics on the wall. So that was one of the reasons why I really, and there was goals nesting there too. Um, but anyway, that was one of the wonderful things about that rock is having the three species there. And it's closer than either Gull Rock or Bodega Rock. Yes. Too. You get a better yeah. look. With the scope, you can really get good detail. Yeah, another reason why I love it. <laughs> and were you able to see that deep azure blue throat yes. of, the, of the double crested when very, they were breeding? Very clearly. And I could tell um, the ones that were done breeding simply because it started feeding super quick. Um, yeah. yeah. And the other thing too that I learned um, was the white patch actually starts to fade pretty quickly. By the time the, uh, the pelagics had the juveniles, that white patch started to disappear and they were identified by uh, their size, but also that green iridescence. You know, once that light hits them and they, they shine and the, and the brands are just black. Now, one reason that we gave up Gleason was because of the peregrine. They're back. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the population of, of other species breeding there begin, began to dwindle year after year after year. And so that's when we gave up monitoring Gleason and went to the west side of Bodega Head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I don't know how my numbers compared with previous years, but it was, it was fun, but, you know. Yeah, but and, and the, the peregrines are all always fun. Yes, they were there. Yeah. Did you have a pair of geese, Canadian geese last year? No, no geese. Uh, but we did have gold. We had two, three nesters uh, of gold. So that was fun. I got to see the chicks and that was fun. So are there any other questions? Well, you were talking about the black oyster catchers. You said there's only 10,000. Are they only located on the West Coast? Yes. Okay. And I'm not sure how far south they go. Okay. Um, they're in the Monterey area. Um, maybe as far south as San Luis Obispo. I'm not sure I'm going to have to look it up. But more than half of them are concentrated north of British Columbia. Okay. Now, there are, there are American oyster catchers elsewhere. And they have the same body shape, except they're black and white. And they have the, the, um, the bright orange bill. And, you know, the, the funny pink legs. And... Um, they may even, they may even be inland. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not at all familiar with them because we don't have them here. You know, we just have the black one. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Alice, I'm on, I'm on, um, I, I actually looked that up and I'm on all about birds and it, and that's the Cornell lab. And it says they range from the Aleutian islands to the coast of Baja. Oh, really? All the way down. Yeah. I've never seen them down there, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. Now, there are a number of them around Pacific Grove in the Monterey area. And again, you know, Sylvia was asking about the success rate. And um, a fellow that I know that works for the California Coastal National Monument monitors them. And um, I guess it was last year. I said, well, how are you doing, Bill? And he says, well, he said we lost the second chick out of the second nest today. Mm -hmm. So, and the problem is at low tide, um, those rocks are accessible to people and land mammals. So, um, and they really have no means of defense. So I always enjoy the black oyster catchers uh, on the south of Doran or the um, 
the north of the Pinnacle Gulch there. And then on the very far end of Pinnacle Gulch, there was a single one. And I was thinking maybe that was the one that had been the child of the pair up further north. Is anyone watching that group? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, what they do, um, they're interesting. If you see them this time of year, you'll see them in large groups. They're very, very social. And um, you'll see them flying like around the head or off of Pinnacle Gulch, you know, or off of Bodega Bay there. And um, they have that high pitch, those high pitched voices and they're all rattling like this. As it gets closer to breeding season, um, that whole sense of sociality just, you know, they become very territorial. You'll see them pair off on rocks and they'll defend that rock. You know, there'll be a group of them flying by and they are there and they will fly out and meet them and chase them away. Um, I've seen them on Bodega Head. Um, the, 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 there's one rock where they, where they nest every single year. I once saw a pair that were flying by land on that rock and they were accepted. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the ones, the adults that were there to breed did not chase them away. And so my thought was, well, maybe these were offspring from the year before because they will hang out with their parents for a year or two afterwards because they it takes them so long to develop those skills some of them chisel you know limpets off of rocks others have to use their mandibles like pliers in order to get into a muscle meat this is not an easy task for them and so they are dependent on their parents for quite some time but um they um the other funny thing is, I suspect there are teenagers, rowdy teenagers, and you'll see groups of five or six of them flying by, and they're just making a racket, and they're just irritating all of the pairs that are trying to breed and trying to nest there. But they are characters. They're really, really fun to watch. Um, you can't help but fall in love with them. You know, and as I said, you saw that photograph of an oyster catcher chasing a raven. And this is just not something that you see every day unless they're trying to chase them off, you know, off of a rock away from their nest. Any other questions? Have you seen their success rate decline um, precipitously over the years? I couldn't say, Kate, I don't know. That was honest. It's just, it's just not good. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was in, I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw a light flash around Kate's name there. So, okay, so I have another. I'm going to talk about. Um, is everybody aware of the four letter code? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'm going to rip through that quickly. <laughs> Okay, as I said, there are very few species that we, that we deal with. And so it, it's not difficult once you can sort out the cormorants. And um, I'll go through the four letter codes very, very quickly. Um, you know, most of these birds, their names, they have two, two words in their names. And it's composed of the first two letters of each of those words. So Western gull is W-E-G-U, common mer, C-O-M-U, pigeon guillemot, P-I-G-U, common raven, C-O-R-A, peregrine falcon, P-E-F-A. Surf bird is one word, so they just use the first four letters. And the cormorants, the pelagic cormorant follows that same that same structure. The double crested cormorant, because it is three words, so it's a D C C O. And Brants is Brack, it's something completely different. And the reason why is that B R C O was taken up by Brown Cowbird. And so to avoid confusion, um, it's the B R A C. And Canada Goose is the same way, it's C-A-N and then the G. Uh, the Western Gull, as I said, it's the only breeding gull here, so it's the only species you have to worry about. The family. Here's the common myrrh. 
the common MERS only have one chick. So everything is invested in that one egg and that one chick. They leave the rock before the chicks are able to fly. Their flight feathers have not grown out. And what happens is that the dad goes down into the water and calls for the youngster. And this is a real leap of faith. The youngsters leap off of the rock into the water and then um, they swim around with dad. Now, because they can't fly, they are totally dependent on the food supply that's local to their rock. So they live and die depending on what kind of year it is and, and the productivity you know, of the prey. Um, during the heat wave in 2014 and 2015, uh, Carol and I were doing beach watch surveys of Salmon Creek, which is um, a beach with a high deposition rate. And on one survey, we documented 95 um, dead common mer, most of them chicks. Little pigeon guillemots. And here you can see the gulars. Here's the double crested with the bright orange gular. And they have a distinctive pattern on their wings too. It looks almost um, Paula, so I don't see your screen. Are you trying to show that to yeah, us? I, to your screen out. is not <laughs> is not being shared. Oh. Yeah, but we're seeing you, Hollis. Yeah. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. There we go. Is it showing now? I'm sorry about that. Uh, there it is. Here yeah. we go. OK, well, then. then I said makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So these are the three cormorant species. Oh, well, then I'll go back to the common mers because they're so cute. Okay, so this is a pear and the chick. There are penguins. <laughs> okay, here are the three cormorant species. And here's the brants with the bright blue gular. And here's a double crested with the bright orange gular and a distinctive patterning on their backs with these, these feathers in the back here. And here is the little pelagic. You see it has a smaller neck, the smaller bird. Um, it shimmers in the light. You can see it's iridescent blue and green and purple and the red gular. But again, these all fade very, very quickly once they lay their eggs. This is the double crested with that wonderful azure throat. And I don't have a photograph of, um, I don't know if you can see, can you make out these blue beads yeah. around the, the turquoise eyes? And I remember somebody saying when they first saw this, oh my God, I need to make a mask. <laughs> this. It, it's just really wonderful. Hollis, is um is there a gender difference to both? Like when you're talking, when we're seeing the 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 gular and the different colors, is that just the female, or is it? No, um, they're both both. Uh, they both do. Right. Okay. Yeah. And again, when you see them in the air, you see this crooked neck, and that tells you that it's a double crested. The brants fly with a straight neck. Here's the white green flash. A little eggs here. Last year, um, there's a whole wall off of the west side of Bodega Head with these little shelves of pelagic cormorants. And um, we were watching them nest and lay their eggs. And the chicks hatched, um, it was the end of June. And then there was the 4th of July weekend and we returned on the following Thursday and the entire wall was empty of nests, chicks, adults. They had just all vanished. And I'd never seen anything like that. We learned that there had been a drone that was flown off of Bodega Head over the 4th of July weekend and it wiped out that entire wall. Sylvia was there photographing um, the day old oyster catcher chicks and they were lost as well. There had been a what? A drone. A drone. Oh, yeah. 
terrible. And I've never seen this. Now in 2006, um, the cormorants had laid their eggs. And then um, I don't know if you're familiar with the upwelling, what happens along the coast with our water. There's, um, there's an upwelling, it starts up at Point Arena and because of the winds, what happens is that the cold nutrient rich water is brought up to the surface. And so the wind is a good thing in the spring. And in May, the wind just died for three weeks. It was wonderful if you like walking on the bluffs, you know, and if you like walking on the beach, horrible for the food supply. And what happened was that all of these cormorants abandoned their nests. Now, I, it was not a big deal seeing them abandon their eggs. But last year, the loss of week old chicks was just heartbreaking. And especially because it was a senseless act by somebody not knowing what they're doing. Um, state parks does not allow drone flying, which we did not realize at the time. And so what's happening now is that no drone signs are going up all along the coast. You heard what happened at Bolsa Chica last year, right? Exactly, yeah. What happened? Somebody crashed a drone into a nesting area of, what, what, they were turns, were they? Elegant turns. Elegant yeah. turns. 3,000 of them. Yeah. Wow, terrible. Now, this is a good example of this, this distinctive pattern that you can see on the back of the double crested forms here. Again, this is the nesting material. Um, this is a branch down here with the vegetation. This is a double crested. You can see the bright orange gular here and the stick nest. Here's some chicks here. When we're counting these birds, I mean, I've been out and taken a look at some of these rocks and they're far away that you're not gonna be able to make out details. Are you going to see uh, mixed cormorants on the same rock? I mean, how would you determine the species when all you can see is this dark silhouette? Juliana, how did you distinguish them? A lot was from the nesting material and knowing that the pelagics liked the, uh, the cliff and they had that white patch. Pelagics were really easy to see. Right. But when you had the backlight on Gleese and they were nesting together up on top. So, you, you know, I could see it through the scope. You're really close at Gleese. So through a scope, I could get, you know, make out the bright neon blue gular and then also the bright orange gular on the double crested. Plus they have these feathers. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I mean, I've been out and looked at Bodega Rock a few times and I'm thinking, you know, I, all I can see is, is shape. I can't see, I can't make out any details. What's the power on the scopes that we use out there? Um, 60 power. But there's only one, there's only one species of cormorant that nests on Bodega Rock. Okay. And that's the brants. And this, this is what I mean. Um, you'll be with experienced mentors, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that are familiar with these sites. And, um, and so they will help you out. Um, gull rock is the same way. If you see any cormorants that are nesting on a rock, they'll be brants cormorants, except there's one rock face on the north side that are pelagics. And again, you can tell by the site where they are. Okay. And if you see the two of them, if you see a pelagic with a branch, they're distinctive because of the size and shape. Pelagics are smaller, they're narrower. Um, the branches are really kind of chunky. And you know, like anything else, Kate, after a while you kind of develop a sense. Yeah. You, you can't really articulate, but you know. No, recognize. I know what you mean. I know what you yeah. mean because I know it with, you know with other things that I've done, you know, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they call it jizz, you know, or there's a posture or there's um, a movement of some sort. It's, it's more than just the field mark. Now, I, well, I can ask the question later. No, no, ask it now. Well, it has to do with breeding. I mean, I know some, um, some waterfowl have a cloacal 
protuberance that's almost a penis, like, you know, you have a, uh, 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 ducks and such. So how many of these mate that way and how many of them just do a cloacal rubbing? Interesting question. It's very, very brief. Which may be, think it's maybe just the rubbing. Yes, yeah. 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 It's very, very quick. Okay, so um, what do we have up here? That's your common myrrh. And an oyster, this side. And an oyster catcher, Western gull, and Brant's cormorant. cormorant. Okay, you got it. <laughs> I did that one last on purpose. <laughs> okay, here you go. Here are the beads around the eyes. Yeah. So what kind of corm is this one? Double crested. Double crested. And here are the crests. Yeah. <laughs> but the brands will have them too. Oh. Okay. Equipment. Um, there's an equipment locker at um, the uh, Salmon Creek Ranger Station. And on the 31st, we'll be gathering there at 10 o'clock so that you can see where it is um, at the combination. We're going to take it up to Bodega Head so that everybody gets some hands-on experience with the equipment. It's you know it's one thing to watch somebody else use it; it's another thing to set up that scope on the tripod and operate it yourself. There's a Kestrel weather instrument, um, but again, you'll never have to do this on your own. You know, the first time you're always with an experienced um, monitor who's been doing this before. The duffel bag will contain a Kestrel, binoculars, a tripod, scope. Um, we, have a, we have a zoom camera and we start off by photographing the rocks. And like if you're a gull rock, for example, um, your first shot is the entire rock. And then you zoom in and you start left to right on the top, overlapping photographs, close up, then the next level down, but you want them overlapping so you get the whole rock all the way down to the base of it. Um, it's a little bit different with Bodega Head because we have several different rocks that we are counting. Um, Bodega Rock is pretty quick and easy because it's only one rock. It's just long and uh, it's not very tall. The reason why we do this is that we um, have photographic evidence of it's, you know, it's not, it's not, they're not clear, sharp, photographs for, um, you know, really being able to distinguish what's going on, but it is photographic evidence of what's on that rock at that time. If there is a serious disturbance, we then have evidence of, we can determine the um, significance of that kind of disturbance. If, for example, they all flee the rock and breeding is interrupted for some, for some reason, and that's why we do the photograph. How much does all this equipment weigh? It is, um, for me, it's heavy, Kate, because I've got orthopedic problems. Yeah, so so do I. That's why I was wondering about it. I'm yeah. thinking, you know, is this something that I'm going to be able to? You won't be by yourself. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, you, you, you've got other people with you. The other thing is that... Um, uh, some people bring their own scopes. They prefer their own equipment, and that's okay, too. It's just whatever works for you. But you're not by yourself hauling that stuff around. So, Hollis, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I have issues with my neck, too, and can't lift. So And you was, were by yourself last year. I was by my, But, you know, I just figured it out. I just made multiple trips to my car, and it worked for me. And you're at a site with Gleason where you didn't have to you know, if you're at Gold Rock, for example, you park up on Goat Rock Road, you have to hike all the way down uh, to the edge of uh, the bluff there, then you have to haul that equipment back up. Right. So I, I, I would, yes. Yeah. So that in Bodega West, I would definitely want a cart. <laughs> well, no, Bodega, no, Bodega Head West is easy. Yeah, that's right. Parking lots right there. You don't have any distance. I mean, in fact, Bodega you don't, Rock. You don't even, yeah, you now, but Dago Rock was what I was wondering about. Yeah. And I know yeah. that once you get off the main trail and you're walking down there, the trail's quite narrow because I was thinking of bringing my little shopping cart down. 
Yes. I don't know if I would get the shopping cart down the, down that real narrow part of the trail though. I did have you approach a good... it that I bring and it, um, it goes halfway down and then I just carried the rest. It's, it's not that far to carry it. If you can bring your shopping cart or baby carriage almost to, to the spot. And as I said with Sylvia, she was hauling a big, heavy lens. You know, this is a significant piece of equipment. And were you approaching from, did you park on the west parking lot or on the east parking lot? Oh, well, um, are you talking to me? Either one of you. Both I of parked you. on the west parking lot. So then I followed the main trail down. And then to get down to where that, I don't know what it is. We don't know either. <laughs> To get down to that, the trail is only about, you know, maybe a foot, a foot and a half wide at that spot. So that's why I was not sure. I went in the other parking lot and I don't know, there were a bunch of different trails that goes, go down to where that like pokey white thing is. But I just chose the widest trail I could find that, you know, it would be really tempting to I suppose we can't really do that, but it would be nice if they could widen, if we just, they can widen some of those areas, but um, it wasn't that difficult. Well, I can, I can walk past where I normally do and see what it looks like from the other side, as far as the trail is concerned. If it's going to be a problem, you know, hauling equipment down there. What you might want to do, Kate, is you might want to try a couple of different sites because some are more accessible than others and see what feels comfortable to you. So right now I have two things limiting me. One is accessibility and then the other one is the price of gas. So for me driving up and down the coast, it's a stretch for me to get to Bodega. And I think that's something that you and I have talked about in our emails recently. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think I'm going to probably end up restricting myself to Bodega Rock for the time being. Um, just because of, I don't know how much more gas it would take to get to these other locations. I'm actually going to be scouting some of the locations tomorrow um, and some of the beaches for tide pooling. Um, my daughter and I are going to check out the coastal beaches tomorrow. Um, so then I can decide, but I mean, I, I don't know yet. Okay. Um, one thing is, is that, um, People coordinate on who's going to pick up the equipment and who's going to drop it off. And the equipment is kept at the Salmon Creek Ranger Station, which is just north of Bodega Bay. Um, so there's a little bit of a distance involved there as well. Um, if you're checking out tide pool areas tomorrow, I want to warn you about Miwok, which is what we normally use for our field trips. And I should do this offline, but right now there's a lot of winter erosion. So you kind of have to clamor over boulders. Right. That's right. not an I'm issue. I'm bringing both of my canes with me, but we were starting yeah. at Miwok and going up to Shell. Okay. Um, if you go on to the, um, the Seabird uh, Google site, there is a volunteer manual there that has maps and directions photo, you know, and photographs to all of the sites, each of the right. sites. Right. And I actually, I actually have those printed. Okay. Uh, now what we do is we monitor each site once a week and we ask for one month, one, you know, shift a month that you commit to. But as I said, some people wind up going out there, you know, like with, with Bill and Mary, they've been going out there every day. Yeah. And uh, the fact that it's once no, a month. Every, it, every week. Um, well, I mean, every shift. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. And, and the yeah. fact that it's, the fact that it's once a month might, you know, might make me want to go out a little bit further too. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's another thing is the schedule. So Gull Rock um, is, a, it's a one hour schedule and they meet at eight o'clock and the monitoring actually takes place between 8.30 and 9.30. Bodega Rock is Monday afternoons. Um, the surveying takes place between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. So they meet at 12.30. The west side of Bodega Head is Thursday mornings. And by the way, the, the times of day here have been selected because 
of the visibility, you know, where the sun's not in your face. Uh, Bodega Rock is um, the west side of Bodega Head is on Thursday mornings from 10 a.m. to 11 o'clock. We're generally out there for um, till maybe 12 or 12:30, and the reason why is because uh, there's a lot of visitation, and um, we are doing interpretation and public education for the, with the people that are out there. Now, Carol did uh, Bodega Rock on Monday and reported that there are a number of hikers that, that passed them by. And they were really excited when they got a view through their scope and got to learn about what was going on out there. So public education is a big part of what we, what we do. Right. You don't have those opportunities down at Gull Rock because people are not normally down on that section of the Cordum Trail at that, at that hour. And as Juliana said, at Gleason, you will get um, visitors. And it's a wonderful opportunity to, you know, Bodega Head West, there are people that come out there and they're looking for whales. And they completely overlook what's going on in front of them. And once they discover it, it's just magical. You know, they, they, they want to get their family members, they come over here and take a look at this. And, and that's that's half the fun is sharing. I, I have to share this story with you about what happened at Bodega Head during one of the, the whale watches. There was a guy there with a scope and a camera. And all of a sudden he says, black oyster catcher. And everybody, I don't know where they came from. They converged on the site. We couldn't see past them a solid wall of people with scopes on this one bird. And ever since then, I've been curious what is the deal with these birds that that you know this particular bird that everyone wanted to see it but yeah it's it's pretty crazy you'll find out you'll find <laughs> <Okay>. out <laughs> Hollis, what day did you say was um the day for gull rock what day of the week gull rock is friday morning Hollis? and if we if we have enough people, um, we're going to do Gleason this year, and that schedule has yet to be determined. That'll be uh, decided among those who are yeah. monitoring it. So Hollis, it sounds like it's either Tuesday or Wednesday because of the equipment. Yes. Okay. And then, you know, going back to the weight issue, you know, full disclosure, I didn't take that huge bag that had all of the information in it. I would just grab some pamphlets, but most people, you know, like you said, they would come out to take pictures of the ocean and I'm there with the scope and they didn't even notice that there were two inner nesting birds there. And it, you know, a time and again, it was one of the funnest things about bird monitoring is showing people um, what's going on that they had no clue. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's, part, and that's part of our purpose, Juliana, yeah. is public yeah. education yeah, and yes. outreach. Yeah. Yes. Are we allowed to let them look through our scope now? We weren't we weren't over the last couple of years. Yeah, we haven't been because of COVID. Right. So has that changed or is that still in place? Um, you know, what I did, if I can just interject because of you know yeah. my my thing, is if they weren't in a mask, I would just simply I would be really candid. I go, look, I got you know my, I'm high risk. I would love to share this with you. Could you please put on a mask? And then once they were done, I would wipe it down with um, sanitizer. That's and one of I the issues, it. yeah, one of the issues that we had also was that when COVID first hit, there was a lot of fear of contact um, of, um, you know, the virus living on a surface. And because we didn't know very much about it. Now, if they're breathing on it, that's another thing altogether. I do not know how long they live. So it's it's a matter of your own comfort. If you're on Bodega Head West, you don't even need all you need are binoculars. They're that close to you. So um, you know, bring a cell phone, water and snacks, a field guide. Um, if you're into journaling or a notebook, by all means, bring that. Um, name this bird. Cormorant. It's easy. We don't monitor during heavy rain, dense fog, high wind, the safety issue. Um, name this bird. Logic. Logic cormorant. How do you know? The white. The white. And it's on. And a, we're, 
uh, its location is on a steep cliff in a little hole. Yeah. <laughs> and the nesting material. Yeah. Okay, and I encourage you to go onto the Google Drive and um, I will post, I will put the link in the chat. And um, in that drive under um, articles and resources, you'll find a list of websites as, as well as many articles on the birds that we are counting and tips for counting birds. Okay, what's, uh, what's this one here? Logic Cormorant. Double Crested Cormorant and Branch Cormorant. You got it down. Okay, so the forms. Uh, use a mechanical pencil because it's sharp. Uh, print. Do not erase. And this is because if there is an issue with a disturbance and it goes to court, um, they like to say that community science or citizen science is bad science. And so if we strike out our mistakes or earlier counts, then um, there isn't a question about data being changed on a count sheet. Include lots and lots and lots of notes. If there are no birds, place zeros in the, in, the, in the cells. Place Xs in the cells if they're not counted for some reason, like if there's fog. And this is what the main data form looks like. It was adapted from one that was in use up at Sea Ranch. And so, um, you know, we cannot tell a downy chick from a full-size chick from a dull brown juvenile um, at the distance that we're at. So what we're looking at is we're looking at adults and we're looking at chicks. And in the case of common MERS, you can't even tell them apart. And so those are just gross counts. This is the primary data form that is used for each of the sites. On the back, there's lots of room for notes and other observations. And um, at the Dega Rock, we're also counting the pinnipeds that are there. And um, we started off doing that in the first year, and then we gave it up because it was kind of difficult and people were catching on to what we were doing. We've only been doing this. This program has only been um, going since 2013. But then we noticed at one point that one year that some of the sea lions were kind of encroaching on the territory of the cormorants. We were always curious about how the cormorants held their own because these are big animals, these big marine mammals that they share this rock with. And when there was some encroachment, we started counting them again because we wanted to document, we wanted to see if um, there were indeed, if they were pushing them out. It turned out to not be the case, but we're counting them anyway. So what does um, OTAR stand for? Um, okay, your sea lions are odoriotids. Okay. And your stellar sea lions are odoriotids. I've got the rest of it. I just couldn't figure that one out. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's that O-T-A-R, that's that four. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to go O-T and A-R <laughs> and not- And the reason the why O-T-A-R-I-D-S. is that sometimes yeah. it's difficult to tell a California from a stellar sea line at that distance. Right. So if you don't know, this is the safest bet. Okay. The stellar is bull, you're gonna know. You know, those oh, things yeah. are gigantic. Yeah, they're huge. So this is what gall rock looks like. And you can see all of the little common MERS that are crowded in here. What we do is we break this rock into sections. So you count a section at a time. There's nothing like getting through 2000 birds. You get interrupted, you have to start over. And suddenly you don't remember, did I count this section before? I remember counting it, but maybe it was two times ago. So it's much easier to break it in sections and so we have a sectional map. This is section one, two, this little section is three. And what we do is we, we also count on two offshore rocks here. And what we have is a supplemental sheet. So uh, here is section one, section two, section three, section four. So you're only dealing with small pieces of it at a time. Somebody asked Bill, how do you deal with 4,000 birds? Well, you don't count them all at once. You break them up like this. The other reason we started doing this was because we started noticing that there were 
in the early years, they were pushing the Brant's cormorants out. I remember I was talking about the Brant's like to be on the upper areas, and we were interested in seeing if they were pushing the Brant's into less desirable breeding spots. So this way we could track any movement of species. Um, there are two other rocks that we count. Um, we call them South Rock and Triangle Rock. The biologists call them subcolony 01 and subcolony 02. And then there's a cliff on the north of Peaked Hill, and that's where the pelagics nest. And so when you're breaking them out like this, it's a much easier way to count. And then that's transferred over to the primary data sheet. The Bodega Rock, um, because there are limited species and it's a long, broad rock, it's a little bit easier to count. Carol was saying that they had some difficulty on Monday because the common MERS were turned away from them. So it was difficult to distinguish them from the cormorants in some cases. We do not use a supplemental sheet for Bodega rock. Um, there are the, here are the masses of California sea lions that are on the east side of the rock. Hollis, do you look at Bodega Rock from Bodega Head or from um, from from uh, Pinnacle Gulch? From Bodega Head. Oh, now Pinnacle Gulch, I should say, um, it's not an observation site, but if you happen to fall in love with the little pigeon guillemots, it's a wonderful place to go to see them because they breed on the Pinnacle Rock there. And I don't know how many of them there are, but there are a lot of them. And they're very active. And when the youngsters are um, large enough to hop off and on the rock, there's just this incredible activity of little black and white birds bouncing back and forth and back and forth and chattering. And um, it's just a wonderful thing to observe. Hmm. So Bodega Head West, because we want to remain consistent with the baseline counts um, at the implementation of the marine protected areas, we count several rocks. Um, there is one main rock, which is here. And so what we do is we break our, we break our supplemental sheet into the main rock where we count nests, adults, and half year chicks, first year chicks, any of the surrounding rocks, and then the face of the bluff, which is the south place of the, and I'm, I'll go back to the photograph so you can see this. Then we also count what's on the water, which we don't do for any of the other sites. And that's because when they were, um, did the baseline counts for the MPA, that's what they did. And we want to remain consistent with them. So this is the main rock here. And this, these other rocks are, yeah. Is somebody asking something? Yeah, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to orient where these, where these rocks are, because what you're calling the main rock looks like it's the rock that you can just about make out the forms on if you are standing where the whale watchers stand and look to the left. Is that correct? That's not you're the looking, If you look under. straight ahead, if you look straight ahead, that's the main rock. Okay. It's, it's the large one. I'm seeing if I have a photograph. Here's a bunch of forms on it. Okay, here, this is the cliff face. Right. Where, the, where you'll find the pelagic cormorants, okay? And you'll find them on each of these faces here. Okay. Unless somebody has flown a drone. This is the side of that main rock. I don't have a photograph that's taken right from the whale watch area, but this is that main rock that's right in front of you. Okay. You're standing on that rock area. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I realize west. now where the where the uh, where that ice plant is in front of the uh, parking lot. Yeah. And what right. we do is you cannot you cannot see all of this rock from one vantage point. Okay. So if you're standing where you're watching whales, you miss all of these on the side. Right. So what I do is I start here and then I walk up the rock and then pick up the rest of them. Okay. And this is something you'll be able to show us when we go out on the 31st. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, again, I mean, I've, I've been photographing this rock for about a month now, but I just, you know, I was just curious. 
Yeah. I mean, if it's and the one have, that I think it is, and I think it yeah, is. Yeah, it's it's that main huge rock that's that's Just right there. Oh, yeah, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That picture. Looks. Okay. Yeah. So this is why we use this supplemental sheet so that we count on the main rock, the surrounding rocks, and the face of the bluff where the pico are, and then what's on the water. And we transfer all of these counts over onto the main sheet, but not those that are on the water. And you are with people that have been doing this for quite some time. So it's not as intimidating. Um, this is a, a sheet that's filled in and you can see that we have, we use zeros if there are no birds. Here is a slash where a count was corrected from 12 to 14, it's not erased. Here a count was increased from 28 to 32. Here are some notes. Um, here they were double crested that were feeding. There's a bunch of wing flopping going on, a bunch of nest repairs. Here the pelagic cormorants were seeing gathering nesting materials. And these are really helpful in painting a picture of what is actually going on out there beyond just the numbers. Mm. Here's the back. There was a boat that was fishing too close. And it did cause a disturbance because two Western gulls flew off, but they soon returned. The incident was not reported as a disturbance because it was minor. Um, we don't count the pinnipeds out there, but she made a note that there were 12 harbor seals on Rock Point, peregrine falcon on Tower Rock. That's one of the peregrines that's out there. And that's it for the forms. Again, you are always with somebody been doing this for quite some time. So you're not left to figure this out on your own, other than Juliana last year. <laughs> I was with her a couple of times. So. so I learned something because we didn't do this orientation either because of COVID and everything no. else. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, a couple of times I erased rather than struck out. So that was really you know, got my attention, went, whoopsie daisy. <laughs> yeah, but that's, but you had no way of knowing Julianne because we didn't have this orientation, so. Luckily, it wasn't too often. I used the side sheet of paper and did my first count and then I counted again. I had to, I was on my own, so I had to do a double count. It was fun. Uh, so let me go, go back. We have, we have three locations we're monitoring right now, Gull Rock, Bodega Rock, and uh, Bodega West. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. And where do you need the most people? I mean, what, where, where do you have higher coverage? Right now, um, we have um, a goodly number of people that are doing gall rock on a regular basis. Uh, last year, Rich wound up doing bodega rock by himself a number of times, which is a real shame because, as I said, that's where we're, we're witnessing the formation of a common mer colony. And, and the and impact of this, that's kind yeah, of what interested me those, in doing this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the impact that those MERS have on everything else that's out there. And so um, that is a priority. Uh, Carol was, she took a hiatus for a couple of years and she's been doing Bodega Rock this year as well. The more the merrier. And if we have enough, as I said, if we have enough, then we'll initiate Gleason again. And, and Hollis, is it every week or is it one week a month that, that people are going out? It's like every, every week. Month, every week, okay. And how much notice do you need in advance? Because I live in Bodega Bay, I could run out there, but I, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's uh, uh, just uh, sometimes, um, uh, like, you know, it's, it's like if I, can you, can you even, do you need to schedule a day in advance or how, how, how or, or is that all explained in the handouts? Okay. Um, the schedule is posted on the Google Drive okay. under the folder for schedule, you know, for calendar. Um, uh, all of our monitors have access to edit that file. So you sign yourself 
in. Some people are a little uncomfortable with Google Docs and they could just let me know and, and I'll pencil you in. Um, if you are new, you are penciled it in green because we want to make sure at least, you know, for the first few shifts, we want to make sure that you're not there on your own. Um, if we have a problem, Diane, if, you know, if you would be willing to, yeah. that would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah. That would be great. I can't guarantee it, but I would, I would certainly be willing to be called. <laughs> no, that would be great. And I encourage you to try different rocks. Yeah. You know, um, there might be an accessibility issue with one. You just might be more interested in the birds or the environment, you know, from one to the other. And people generally settle in on their own, but they don't need to. You know, you don't need to decide on any site that's yours. You can move around as much as you like. It's just that some people, most people, they get interested in what's going on on that rock from week to week to week as things change, you know, and they know that environment. The Gull Rock people, now Rich will go, last year he was helping out at Gull Rock, but he was really interested in what was going on with the common MERS that were settling in on Bodega Rock, and we needed his help there. Uh, the rest of the Gull Rock team, they stick to Gull Rock and that's it. Um, one thing that everybody does is after a shift, uh, one of the people will post um, their counts to the entire group. And so you not only learn the counts, but also other interesting things that were going on out there. And everybody seems to really enjoy seeing and hearing about what's going on on the other, on the other site. And what happened last year is that I was um, copying uh, Michelle or Leslie in the steward's office, and they wound up taking blurbs, excerpts to put in the e-news every week, which is kind of fun. And so um, stewards members were let in on what was going on out there as well. One of the things that I've heard over and over from people that have joined this program is that they never view the rocks offshore the same again. You know. Mm -hmm before viewing this family life and this drama that's going on out there, they would drive down the coast, you know, these rocks offshore, and that's what they saw. Now they're seeing them as a site of, you know, it's job one for these birds. The other thing that I've always kind of, um, always kind of amused me is that if you read about, um, you know, there are birding books on where to go, you know, during what season, and Bodega Bay is a wonderful place in the fall when the shorebirds move in and in the winter when you have the shorebirds and the waterbirds there in the spring and the summer is kind of dead. And I've always found that really, really amusing because to me, that's the really interesting season because that's when they're there raising their families and that's job one to them. You know, that's, this, is, this is what it's about for them. You know, so biology is, is all sex and death. This is something we're going to be doing year round. This isn't going to be something that we do for certain seasons. Uh, no, the season actually starts April 1st. And because most of them fledge throughout um, late July and August, the season ends on August 31st. What's happened this year is that the common myrrh arrived almost two months early. And so this is interesting. And so, um, People decided, well, it was in February, people were going out and getting initial counts and we kind of evaluated what we wanted to do. So um, in February, we did Bodega Rock and Gull Rock every two weeks. And we started doing it every week throughout the month of March. <laughs> so we actually started six weeks early okay. and full bore weekly scheduling as Mary knows throughout the month of March. Yeah. I had a question. Oh. I was just going to ask if you could repeat the days and times of the three sites. I think I got confused last uh, when you did that. Just briefly, if you could. Okay. Gull Rock is Friday mornings from 8.30 to 9.30. The shift is from 8.30 to 9.30. You actually meet at 8 o'clock to get down there. Right. Um, Bodega Rock is Monday afternoons. The shift is from 1 to 2. Yeah, I and um, the Dig Ahead West is on Thursday mornings from 10 to 11. 
Great. Yeah, I have now, those, what you do I have is, those crossed. Yeah. Now, what you do is you look at the schedule and you coordinate mm -hmm. with each other on who's going to pick up the equipment, you know, and usually somebody volunteers, you know, they see that a couple of people are on the schedule. Mary, you've experienced that with Bill and Ellie. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, somebody else offers to drop it off, take it back. Where is, where is Gull Rock actually located again? It is um, south of Jenner. Um, do you know where Shell Beach is? Yeah, and the Cordum okay. Trail. And the Cordum Trail begins there. And if you drive north on Highway 1 from Shell Beach, you see Goat Rock Road to the left that goes down to Goat Rock Beach. And you park up on Goat Rock Road and then walk down the trail down to the base of the bluff there. It's the closest okay. point, observation point for Gull Rock. You're right at the base of Peak Hill. The um, volunteer manual. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just, I'm yeah. just, I'm just looking at the distance right now and okay, yeah. mapping it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's over an hour for me. Yeah. Yeah. So is everybody interested in doing this this year? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a great opportunity to um, both be out in nature, be with people that love it, and be with people that know stuff that I don't know that I'm just hungry to learn because it's so fantastic. And that's it for me. You know, it's like it's going to be good to be with somebody who's been doing it for a long time. Usually there's things I pick up on real quick. I don't know what it is with me and birds, but <laughs> I just, I'm afraid I'm going to go out there and I go, wait, what's the difference between all the cormorants again, you know? So, um, so I'm going to be glad to have that experience mm -hmm. and uh, be able to be with someone. The first day I came to get into the, the groove with the birds. The first day I came out to Gold Rock, we were walking, you know, from the upper road, down the trail, across, and this bird like flew through the bushes and I was like well, what's that <laughs> and it was a burrowing owl and um so you know I couldn't have told you that I mean it, for me it just then disappeared into some other bushes and then Ellie saw it and then we caught it and so yeah it's great to be with others because um and and there yeah. are some things I just I don't know what it is my daughter she's like mom what kind of bird is what what is that I said it's a hawk she says I know it's a hawk what kind and I'm like I mean three years looking at pictures of hawks I I know yeah you know the other thing that's really interesting is that we're all learning a lot you know people were talking about behavior and um Bodega Head West I love Bodega Head West for that reason because it's so close you can actually observe the interaction oh, yeah. between the parents and the chicks and then like I think it was last year, I just started giggling out loud because um, there was a Western gull that was on one little ledge here. And then there was a pair of Brant's Pomerants down a little bit lower. And then another pair of Brant's Pomerants there. And while this, this pair of Pomerants were in the middle, they were stretching up, kind of challenging the gull. And they weren't paying attention to their own nest material. So the cormorants that were down a couple of feet lower were busy snatching nest <laughs> material. <laughs> They're little thieves. <laughs> you know? And I just couldn't help it. You know, I just started giggling out loud. And so there are these little things that you, you pick up on. But one of the things that we've all learned is, um, you, you know, these common murs, they only stand about this high. They waddle around like little penguins. And here the pelagic cormorants are two or three times their size, right. and they push these guys out. And then down on Bodega Rock, you've got the cormorants that are living with these enormous pinnipeds, and they seem to maintain their territory against big sea lions somehow. And it's just been fascinating to watch how they all interact among themselves, how they all maintain their territory. You know who's in charge here and why and that's, and these are things that you learn 
that's what I noticed about photographing Bodega Rock over the last few weeks is that you have this pile of pinnipeds and then you have a no man zone and then you have all of these cormorants you know it was just it I was I was kind of amazed by that well so are we so are we <laughs> But, you know, and what was a shock to us was when the common merge in Gull Rock, as I said, they finally just pushed the cormorants out. There were no cormorants nesting on that rock. Mm -hmm. The following year, the MERS arrived and they're all rafting in the water surrounding the rock. They weren't climbing up on the rock, but the peregrines happened to be perched on top of that rock. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, it gave some cormorants an opportunity to nest. And I think, I think they wound up with 250 of them or something up there. Then the year that um, COVID hit in 2020 and state parks was closed, we weren't able to get out there in April. We didn't get out there until like June 9th or something. You know, we're two months into it. And Ellie said, my God, there are cormorants nesting on Gull Rock. And we were all very curious about what was going on in those two months that allowed them to get a foothold. So is it the size difference between the cormorants and the, um, the common myrrh that made uh, one more threatened by the falcon than the other? Is that what it is or? Who knows? <laughs> I was hoping you did. <laughs> no, who knows? <laughs> and this is part of the fun of it. You know, I, I, have been, I have been scoping the cormorant colony on Goat Rock for several years before the myrrhs moved in. You know, and so all of a sudden you kind of get, uh, you know, this is what happens and you, you know, and it's, you're not too excited about things. And all of a sudden there's a big change and changes from year to year to year. And so it never gets dull. It never gets dry. And, and, and who knows? We just don't know. When the common MERS arrived early this year, um, Phil Capitolo, who is a avian biologist out of UC Santa Cruz, he was going, well, you know, sometimes they land on those rocks, but they don't do very much for a while. Well, in other places last year, there were also early breeding season. Um, at Alcatraz last year, there's a large Grant's Cormorant colony that started breeding in March, which is way early. And last year, the common MERS arrived about a month early, but maybe they had been there earlier than that, but nobody noticed because they're so far out. Now we we are keeping um, temperature, wind speed. We're keeping all of that data on these logs too, right? I I, I thought I remembered seeing that. Okay, yeah. so what have we seen? Have we seen average changes over the last couple of years that might account for some of the earlier earlier no. nesting? No, we don't we don't know. Hi, Juliana. Thank you for thank you for coming. It was nice to yeah, see you I again. Yeah, I got to go too. Yeah, thanks so much. It's fantastic to work with you. Uh, yeah, we're coming up on seven o'clock. So, um, does anybody else have any other questions? I had a burning question. Okay. Um, Do you go by Mary or Mary Jo? Mary Jo. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the burning question is: you mentioned. Um, tips for looking at birds would be in a Google Drive under articles and resources. Is that a link you're going to put here in the chat or in the emails that you've been sending? Oh, oh. Um, I'll send you an email, Mary Jo. Okay, great. That, um, that's easier then, because then you have all of that. Yeah, that's great. I do really appreciate the links you put in the emails. That really helps a lot. Um, was that... Um, is that the same area where the maps are going to be located? Um, I don't know if I need a map, to be honest. But um, um, there is a know. folder that has the volunteer manual in it, which really needs to be updated. And I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, other things happen. Um, it, it basically needs to be updated, I think, with Bodega Head West. But there are checklists there for how to use the Kestrel. Um, how we photograph the rocks, um, the schedule, and maps. And that's all under a folder that I think it reads volunteer manual. There are a lot of different folders there. There's another folder that's all completed forms. This has all of our data going back to 2013 when we first began. 
so, so really that would be good homework for me to do between now and two weeks when I meet you, right? I mean, yeah, I and the articles weeks. and resources <laughs> okay. section, I mean, we find things, okay, I shared with um, Diane and Kate an article on divorce in common MERS. Now common MERS, they make for life, you know, but according to this study, um, well, one of them is off foraging for food, <laughs> you know, for the chick. Mom might be there with the chick, but she is eyeing what's going on with the other MERS. You know, paying attention and noting um, good providers. Oh, that guy's a good provider because you never know. Um, you may lose your mate and you may be looking for others. And so the title of this study is Divorce and Common MERS. Who knew? And as Diane said to me, she said, I love this article. You know, they may be more like us than we ever realized. <laughs> so there's, you know, there are studies in there. Um, if you see anything with Phil Capitolo, he's done studies of prospecting, the MERS that were, were prospecting. Um, uh, Cormorant colonies in Oregon and Washington. And of course, that is what we were seeing the last two years on Bodega Rock before having confirmation that they were actually breeding there last year. They weren't just hanging out, looking around. They were actually raising young there. So there's all kinds of stuff. There's tips on counting. There's just a mishmash of things in that one folder. But yeah, please, I'll send the link out to all of you tonight. So, so um, real quick. I don't, how often, or do people update this as they go? I mean, do they add their own names to the Google Doc for the schedule? Yes, yes. Okay, because there's, there's nothing, I don't see anything beyond today and nothing at all on Bodega Head. Well, Bodega Head Westside starts April 7th. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing for the next several weeks on any of them. So do people just do it like last minute or how does that work? Our season really doesn't start for another two or three weeks. Okay. Okay, and that's why. Part of the reason why is that we made up the schedule very, very quickly uh, when we realized when we made the decision that we were gonna start counting then. And so um, we didn't even know if we were gonna count every week. Uh, you know, in March, we were making these decisions on the fly simply because of the arrival of these birds. Right. Well, and I would make the comment to that point is that maybe next year there'll be discussion prior to that whether the schedule needs to be moved up if it's if exactly find out that the common mirrors are going to, you know, show up in March instead of February. exactly. Yeah. Somebody happened to be hiking on the cordon and noticed birds on the rock and let Ellie know. And within two days, there was a team down there doing a count. I think Rich had gone by, was driving up on Goat Rock Road and he took a look. He says, you know, it looks like there's a couple thousand birds there. And so, I mean, within two days, uh, we had a team on Friday morning scouting Gull Rock. We had, Rich went down to Bodega Rock on um, Saturday to see what was going on there. And then we kind of got our heads together for a couple of days and worked out a schedule that, yeah, we want to start we want to start counting now. We want to see what happens. Because sometimes, as Phil said, I got his input. He said, well, sometimes they arrive and then they take off. And so we wanted to make sure that something was actually going on there. So what I'll do is um, I want to firm up our contact list for this year. And I've, um, I've gotten commitments from most of the veterans. There's just two I haven't heard from. And I'll send something out to each of you confirming that you want to be put on the list and on the mailing list. And um, then the, you know, the schedule is open to you. Okay. Anything else? Hollis, oh, I'm excited. I, Hollis, oh. this is Anna. May, may I also have that link? Oh, absolutely. I'll send it out to all of you. Oh, uh, okay, do I have good. your email address? Um, I think so, because I received the notice, the reminder about this meeting from you. 
Okay, good. Then I do. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it out to all of you. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited. It's um, it's really nice to have an infusion of fresh blood and enthusiasm here, and I think you'll enjoy it. I, I really do. And I'm one of the things, well. yeah, I have to tell you, and you know, I keep I keep reiterating, you don't need a lot of experience to do this. It's on the job training. And um, one of the great joys that I had was in, I think it was one of the first seasons that we were going. There was somebody that had never birded in her life and the season ended and there she was, she was scouting eBay to buy her own scope, you know, and this had been something that gave me so much pleasure over the years and to see this activity enrich somebody else's life in the same way was really, really rewarding. So I, I hope that you feel the same way too. I'm very excited about this opportunity. I, I love the thought that there's continuity in, in being able to observe the birds over time and get to know them. Yeah, there's an intimacy that you develop um, other than, oh, there goes a Western gull. Yes. You know, now I get very irritated when somebody says, oh, it's just a gull. Well, now, wait a minute. It's not just somebody's mother. <laughs> yes, somebody's mother. And they have personalities. <laughs> and the other thing that I really enjoy about this program are the people. And I think Sarah can attest to that because she joined us last year and she was commenting on, you know, there's a there's a sense of teamwork and camaraderie with this group, which is really, really nice. That's and again, wonderful. it's, you know, I, I we're definitely, talking about definitely attest to that. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful group. And I just wanted to offer a quick comment. I do recommend if you're new to it and a little nervous, bring a tiny notepad with you so you can scratch out the numbers first before you try to fill out the sheets. It's, a, it's a simple tip, but it, it made a difference for me. Yeah, that's a great Absolutely. suggestion. Okay, well, thank you so much for showing up tonight. Okay. Thank you. I learned With, a lot. After getting knocked off and coming back on and, <laughs> and I got knocked off. <laughs> I just did as well. Came back on my phone. <laughs> Good night, everybody. And Good thank night. you all. Yeah. And thank I you very forward, much. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Okay, likewise. Take care. <laughs>